Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. And I appreciate the library hosting this event tonight. And thank you, all of you, for being here tonight. <clears throat> As Lisa mentioned, it is Flag Day. I hope you've had a nice Flag Day. But it is actually just a coincidence that I'm speaking on Flag Day about a book that has parts of two flags on the cover. I'm sure you recognize part of the American flag and part of the Cuban flag. Uh, it is not a coincidence, however, that it is Caribbean Heritage Month. We talked about the, the appropriateness of me speaking in June. And uh, it is indeed Father's Day on Sunday. And the name of my book is Fatherlands. And it does talk a lot about being a father and parenting. It's been a dream of mine to write a book, to make the book available, have people read the book, and it's also been a dream of mine to talk about the book with family, with friends, and with people who I haven't met until tonight. So thank you for being part of my dream. <laughs> During the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, my book, I'm going to read some excerpts from my book, and afterward uh, I'll answer your questions, and I'll also offer discounted copies of my book to you if you haven't yet purchased one. So about my book, uh, actually about myself. I've been living in Long Branch for 10 years. I was born in New York City, spent part of my preschool childhood in Cuba, spent a good chunk of my childhood in New York City, but I've actually spent most of my life in New Jersey. I've been married for 41 years to Noreen, my wife, who's with us tonight. We have two sons who are adults and independent and a great source of pride for Noreen and me. I am a communication professional. I began my career as a journalist. I did corporate communication work for a variety of companies. And for the last 10 years, I've been a self-employed communication consultant. I've also been a lifelong writer. I've written newspaper articles, I've written press releases, advertisements, brochures, copy for annual report, presentations, internal newsletters, I've written short stories, poetry, blogs, and finally, my first book. <laughs> As you may guess, I am Cuban-American. My parents were both born in Cuba, came to this country as teenagers before the revolution, got married, and started their family. So about my book, people ask me, Charlie, what is your book about? I describe it as a memoir with a twist about the journey of a Cuban-American who was born Charles Lopez and then became known as Charles Bruns. It covers what it was like for me to be a New York City kid and a New Jersey guy during the second half of the 20th century. It explores the impact of the journey of my identity as a son stepson and father on my own family and my career. It also touches upon Cuban immigration in the US, Cuban Americans I've gotten to know during my lifetime, and it also talks about the Latino presence here in Long Branch. So besides being thrilled that I finally wrote the book I was meant to write, had it published, had people read it. I've also been very touched by the feedback that I've gotten on my book from readers. 
nearly all the reviews that have been posted in Goodreads, Amazon, Barnes and Noble have rated it very highly. I've received many favorable comments about the book online. Some of the excerpts are on the screen right now. And I've also had a lot of family and friends and others send me messages directly about my book that really made me feel great. Among the most interesting reviews of my book is one that was posted on Goodreads and Barnes and & Noble, and I want to read it to you. It's just two paragraphs. Fatherland's Identities of a Cuban American took me inside the life of a tempest-tossed kid, born in the States but flung back to his family's Cuban ancestral home as its revolution raged on for long enough to have memories that needed piecing back together. It is a wild ride back into new alien environments in New Jersey with brutally honest family comedy drama assessments. For me, the biggest benefit was a better understanding of the highly complex, sometimes difficult to fathom, Cuban community within America's borders that give the national political parties fits and starts every national election cycle. <laughs> I'm not nearly at the enlightenment level yet, but this work provides a key piece of that puzzle. Thank you, that was an interesting review. The most scholarly review of my book was undoubtedly posted by someone named Nona B, who I do not know by that name. It was four very insightful paragraphs long, two of which read as follows. Who are you? Hearing that question, no matter how well-intended and innocuous in its delivery, can immediately bring up a moment of hesitation regarding how one responds. We would expect to answer this question with our name. But which name? First name? Full name? Nickname? Do we include the prefix, suffix, or credentials? Whenever we answer, who are you, we use our name to assert our power, to declare our identity. Depending on timing and context, our name can either open doors or block opportunities. Would Charles Anthony Bruns on the cover of this book be as impactful? Would a resume that reads Charles Lopez get as many callbacks for a white-collar, middle-class job? How do years of being called El Nino, the boy, intersect with one's own sense of family, vulnerability, and independence? In this regard, the author's name takes the reader along its own unique journey, becoming a major character in this memoir as the mentor. Thank you, Nona B. <laughs> <laughs> At this time, I would like to share a few excerpts from my book with you. The first excerpt is from the prelude on pages six and seven of the book. As the sun was setting one early evening in mid-April 1961, a four-year-old boy looked out the window of the Havana, Cuba home his tia abuela, Spanish for grand aunt, and tío abuelo, grand uncle, shared with him. He saw dozens of young men, some of them throwing on their shirts while clutching a few belongings, 
frantically running out onto the street and jumping into the backs of slow-moving trucks. Vamos a luchar contra los americanos! Let's go fight the Americans, the little boy heard the young men yell. Some of them were angry, others simply excited. The boy was stunned by the commotion as neighbors spilled onto the street, watching the trucks slowly fill with loud young men. He turned, his, he turned to his tía abuela and tío abuelo and said, Pero yo soy americano, but I'm an American. That was the start of this boy's twisting, turning journey with his identity. That boy was me. Some of you might recognize the timing of that passage as having taken place during the Bay of Pigs invasion. In the following pages, I will share with you how Charles Anthony Lopez became Charles Anthony Bruns. You will read how a Cuban-American boy's identity evolved as he became an American man. Along the way, you will read what it was like for me to be a New York kid and New Jersey guy during the second half of the 20th century. How I struggled with the father figures who bestowed their names on me, the impact my identity had on my own family and career, and who I have become today. We are defined by who we are and what we are not. Come along for the ride and perhaps you will learn more about not only me, but possibly yourself and millions of others around our diverse world whose identities are being transformed by immigration, separation, condemnation, assimilation, cultural changes, or ultimately their own self-realization. Thank you for listening to that. Next I'm going to read from chapter 11, page 102. For the past several decades, perhaps longer, it seems white Cubans and Cuban Americans have been considered among the most privileged of Latinos in the United States. Personally, I've gotten that sense at times from fellow Latinos who learned I was Cuban American. I've also felt some resentment at times from other Latinos, mostly those who are black or have indigenous ancestry. This is likely because of the history of Spaniards in the Caribbean islands and Central and South America, and the discrimination blacks and Latinos of indigenous descent continue to face in the U.S. today. My mother and I saw old black and white baseball players mixed very amicably during the mid-1980s when we went to a Cuban old-timers event at the since-demolished Roosevelt Stadium on Kennedy Boulevard in Union City, New Jersey. The stadium was in the heart of the second biggest, after the Miami and Hialeah, Florida area, Cuban-American neighborhood in the U.S. Few of the players whose baseball cards I had collected were there. Most of the ball players were Cuban League veterans of ex or ex-U.S. minor leaguers whose names I did not recognize. My mother and I were happy to be there nonetheless. She got a particular kick out of watching the old-timers play and hearing another middle-aged woman say loudly, Que buenos eran antes, pero que viejos son ahora. <laughs> how good they once were, but how old they are now. Thank you for listening to that. My next excerpt is from page 150. It's uh, chapter 15. Long Branch is certainly the most diverse place I've resided since living in New York City. 
the population of Long Branch is 51% white, 30% Hispanic, and 13% black. According to U.S. Census Bureau estimates published by Census Reporter in 2018, my sense is that most of the city's Hispanic population is Mexican, Central American, and Puerto Rican. There are also many Brazilians in Long Branch. Although they are often considered Latinos, Brazilians are technically not Hispanic since they speak Portuguese rather than Spanish. But my Brazilian barber in the West End neighborhood of Long Branch and many of his shop's patrons do remind me of many Hispanics I've met. The city of Long Branch has a fascinating history. For this reason, I was motivated to write a poem, The Friendly City, No Vacancy, about its past and present. I posted my 118 line history about the city on my blog, 1400 characters, in 2019 and read it at the Brighton Bar just a few blocks from my home that September. Thank you for listening to that. Next, I'm going to read a paragraph in the same chapter, page 152. And this was a surprise to me when I was doing my research as was actually quite a bit of the research that I did in this book, to be honest. Long Branch also holds a fleeting place in Cuban baseball history. In 1913, the Long Branch Cubans became the first U.S. minor league baseball team composed almost entirely of Cubans, according to the Jorge Figueredo book, Cuban Baseball, A Statistical History, 1878 to 1961. Because of low attendance at their games, the team moved out of Long Branch after the 1915 season. Mm -hmm. Who knew? The last excerpt I'm going to read, unless you insist I read more, is the first paragraph of my postscript. Remember, I started out by reading my prelude. Now I'm going to read the first paragraph of my postscript. One morning during the middle of April in 2020, a 63-year-old man stood on the balcony of the Long Branch Beachfront Condominium Unit he shared with his wife. He saw a group of surfers in the ocean waiting to jump on their boards to ride a wave. A coronavirus pandemic was sweeping across New Jersey, the U.S., and much of the world on this day, but the man remained focused on all the blessings life had bestowed on him. He thought about all the waves he had rode during his twisting and turning journey through life and all those that remained to be navigated in the years ahead. That man was me. Thank you for listening to my excerpts. At this time, I'll be happy to answer your questions. How long did it take you to do the research? I would say the better part of two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the better part of two years. I began writing the book late 2019, and then when the pandemic arrived, the whole process accelerated because there were no concerts to go to at night. There were no baseball games to watch on TV. There just wasn't a lot to do except work from my home office. So I said to myself, I'm going to seize this opportunity to write the book I was meant to write instead of just complaining about the pandemic. And most of the information was taken from um, your own life? Various, various sources. So I spoke a lot 
to my family members, especially my father's side of the family. Um, which father? Yeah, I'm just my, which father? My father versus my stepfather. So um, my father passed away in 1987, but I stayed in touch with the family. And when I started writing on this, writing this book, I had a lot of conversations with them, some exchange of emails, and uh, a lot of the information about my family was from them. I did a lot of online research as well from various sources that I, I cite throughout the book. What about from your mother's side? Were you able to get information on once they separated, where she went, and how you were raised? Fortunately, I had a lot of that information because my mother lived until 10 years ago. And we had a lot of conversations about what happened to her and my father. And um, I had conversations with other people from my mother's side of the family. I remember speaking to my abuela mm -hmm. who passed away a little over 30 years ago, my uncle and other people, my brother. So uh, I, I had already more information about my mother's side of the family than I did my father's. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I learned so much about my father's side of the family by researching this book. Yes? Charlie, so you mentioned you have a brother. I think from reading this older brother, right? I have an older, older brother, brother and I have a younger half brother. Right. So your older brother that went through some of the same experiences you, you may have gone through, especially as a child, right? And you've, you've gained research from him to write some of the passages in the book. But how, how would you describe your experience and how it differs from your brother's experience? Wow. My brother and I share so many similarities and yet we are so different. And I explain that in the book. I'll give you an example. My brother has lived in North Carolina for over 30 years. He's very happy on the property that he raised his family in and he'll be happy to spend the rest of his life there. He even has a trace of a Southern accent. <laughs> I'm an urbanite. I draw a lot of energy from New York City. I love the fact that I live in an urban beach community. And um, we're just very different. But his identity is the closest to the journey of my identity, as you'll discover in the book. And he and I have always remained close. We never let our differences come between us. And to this day, we remain very close. We've always been close, even though we are so different. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Charlie, I found, first of all, I, I really enjoyed the book. I thought it was outstanding. It was written. It was, it was terrific. But as I read through the book, when you went through this process, was this almost like a therapeutic type of process, writing this out? Because it was very personal at times. I, I, when I was reading, I said, wow, we're really seeing you and these interpersonal relationships with your stepdad. So I was curious when you went through this, did, was it a re self realization or is this something you had known and you needed to put down or it evolved as you wrote it? I would say it was a little bit of both. I. It was the book I was meant to write. From the beginning, I had an idea what I was going to write and why I was going to write it. As I got deeper into it, deeper into conversations with family members, deeper into research, it was at times therapeutic, but at times it also was painful. It was hurtful. Um, there were times when I wrote this book that I would be laughing. 
at some of the things that I was remembering and writing. And, and quite frankly, there were times when I almost cried. And, and Noreen remembers once when I was doing research and I came across something that I had not realized. And it was extremely painful. And I, I read it to Noreen and I, I think that was um, one of my most tearful, painful moments of writing the book. So it was definitely a very emotional experience. On the other hand, it was also a very rewarding experience. So when I finished the chapter or when I finished writing for the day, I had a real sense of accomplishment. And the feedback that I've gotten from family members has been very, um, I don't know how to say it, but it, it may be glad that I did what I did. So you brought up my brother. Mm -hmm. When my brother read, my older brother read my manuscript, he said, Charlie, you, you nailed it. And he ordered copies of my book to give to other family and other friends. And um, it, it, was, it was very redeeming to, to have that kind of reaction. But for me personally, yeah, it was both therapeutic, joyful, painful, emotional. It was definitely not a writing a press release type of experience. You definitely can feel that as you read it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sort of owing to some of the blurbs that you presented and some of the things that came out of these very um, insightful reviews that you read, um, and it speaks to one of the points behind you, which is, is this your autobiography. Um, you described it as a memoir with a twist, and um, so it being um, I wonder if, because it's so different from your professional life that you've done in the past when you're writing for the corporate world or journalism, um, if you were um, channeling any literary inspiration um, or if there was times that you took breaks to read and write poetry or literature of different kinds um, to get out of that um, really grounded real world. Yeah, so I never, I'm very fortunate that as a self-employed communication consultant who's basically working from home and most of my clients are pharmaceutical companies, my work never paused during the pandemic. I am so grateful for that. My travel did. I wasn't visiting my clients, but my work never stopped. So while I was working on this book, I kept ghostwriting executive presentations and newsletter stories and annual report content and whatever my clients needed. So that part of my writing didn't stop. I continued writing some poetry and um, I did some blog posts, but I really saved my, my non-billable writing work to this, because I, I really wanted to give it all the energy that it deserved, all the emotion and time and passion that it deserved. So it wasn't the only thing I was working on. And some of these things that I mentioned, um, I enjoy doing, obviously. I, that's why I've been doing this for 10 years on my own. Um, but uh, this, this was my primary, um, let's say, fun writing, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Yes. So I read the book also, and it is very personal, and there's a lot of stuff that would not be easy to put out into the public, and I know your mom has passed and your father's, so, and your brother seems to be okay with it, but how is it for you having this very personal information now, so available for everyone to read and, and know about you? Well, um... So as I mentioned a moment ago, it's been therapeutic. Reading the book, you, you got the sense that 
my family story, certainly my relationship with my stepfather, was not what it seemed to be on the surface. And I felt that even among family and friends, the truth of, of my identity, my story, wasn't out there. So it was therapeutic to write it. And I really thought long and hard about what to include and what to exclude. I spoke to family members about it, including my own children. And I, I think I landed at a place where I felt comfortable putting the story out there. To me, it was truthful, it was defensible, and um, I, I was glad that I did it. And, and yes, it is very personal, and that's why I refer to it as a memoir with a twist. And to, to kind of get back to another question, uh, I, I don't consider this an autobiography. Uh, it really is a memoir with a twist. And if it was an autobiography, it would be much longer than 200 pages, and it would be not nearly as interesting, I assure you. <laughs> yes? I'm sorry, we didn't, I didn't get to read your book. We just decided to come up yesterday. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Know you. All about it, but uh, thank you for having us. I just wanted to understand a little bit about the time frame when you lived in the United States. You were born here, or just went back to Cuba, and just mm -hmm. understanding that part. Okay. Read it, so, as I mentioned, uh, my parents came to this country as teenagers before the revolution, got married here, started their family here. They got divorced before I started school. I wound up being sent back to Cuba for what was supposed to be a few months, and it turned out to be almost two years. Came back to my home in New York City not knowing a word of English, and did most of my uh, schooling through sixth grade there before moving to uh, New Jersey. So as far as years go, I was born in 56. The revolution happened in 59. I spent most of 60, 60 most of 61 and 62 in uh, Cuba. Uh, came back just in time to start school in 62 and moved to New Jersey in 67. Okay. Yo soy viejo. <laughs> yeah. It's a historical time thing. Yeah. Sorry, have you been back? I have not been back. I would like to be back one day, but um, I don't want to go back as long as there's a Castro that's alive. Yeah. yeah. So Charlie, I know I always thought you were German. <laughs> when you came to the library to talk to me about doing a program, I was like, "Oh, you're Cuban." <laughs> um, so how do you feel? Uh, you said a name. Your name is what how you present yourself, and most people know you as Charles Bruns. So how how have you kind of meshed the two halves? That was one of the reasons I wrote the book, because so many people were shocked as I grew up and launched my corporate communication career and found out that this guy, Charles Bruns, was actually a full-blooded Cuban. <laughs> I always was aware and conscious, uh, conscious and proud of being Cuban. As you'll read in the book, my mother drilled into me very young that I am Cuban. Tu no es puertorriqueño, or anything else. I am Cuban. I also have a whole chapter in the book about how my name became Bruns instead of Lopez, which many people have said to me was unbelievable to read. Certainly something like that could not happen in this day and age, but it happened back in the late 60s and 70s. I honestly don't feel good about my name. Honestly. I am Charles Lopez, but I am legally Charles Bruns. My wife is Noreen Bruns. We have two sons 
who have the Bruns surname. And that's why a few years ago, like many people, mostly women, I decided to take on my firstborn name as a middle name for social media and other purposes. So I told Noreen, when it comes time for me to be buried in the ground, please have the tombstone read Charles Lopez Bruns. <laughs> Yes. How do your how do your kids feel about the book? I mean, they must have learned a lot in reading this book about their dad. And how has it changed their way of thinking about their heritage? My kids did learn a lot yeah. reading this book. I've always spoken to them about their Cuban heritage, but remember, I learned a lot researching and writing this book, and therefore. When they read the manuscript, and I shared it with them before it was published, they too learned a lot. I, I think they got a new appreciation for how different their childhood was compared to my childhood. I think they got a new appreciation, not that they needed it, for how different my relationship was with my father's compared to their relationship with their father. And I get the sense that they were glad I wrote the book after a little concern initially when I told them what I was doing. And I, and I, I like to believe, and maybe Noreen can correct me if I'm wrong, but I like to believe they're also very proud that um, I wrote the book, I published the book, the book is being read, and the content of it. I, I think it was my my oldest son, when he was, after he read a draft of the book, he said, Dad, I had no idea that you hustled so much for money when you were younger. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'll just answer one more question and then I'll wrap it up. Some people have asked me, well, Charlie, since you're a writer, this book had to come easily or naturally to you, right? My answer is an emphatic no. <laughs> it was the most challenging writing project I've undertaken since learning the English language. It was hard work. And as I explained, it was a very emotional process. OK, in closing, thank you for being here and making a dream of mine come true. And thank you, Lisa and the library, for hosting this event. I have copies of my book for sale tonight. It's regularly $11.99 if you go online and purchase it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble or another online retailer. But tonight, <laughs> I will offer it for $9.99 for cash purchases and $10.99 for credit card purchases. And I'll be glad to personalize your book if you wish. Now, if you want to buy a digital download of the book, or you want to consider buying the paperback at a future time, or you want to just tell somebody about it, please feel free to take one of my business cards. They're on that table by where it says Fatherlands, and they're also on that table. And uh, it's got uh, the name of my book, the ISBN code, my email address and website, and on top of it all, they make good bookmarks. <laughs> so again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.